What's going on, Grinder School? This is Characters, and welcome back to episode number two of the new series I'm currently making called Common Pitfalls. Um, really excited about this series. It's basically PowerPoint based, um, where we go through the common pitfalls that a new grinder um, can easily fall into. It's something that I've basically decided to make because I've been coaching for a while now and I've seen the same problems, the same pitfalls sort of rear their ugly heads time and time again. And so um, what I want to do is make an archive of all these different pitfalls that you can easily fall into, but also easily avoid with a little bit of awareness and show you guys what they are and how we can deal with them. So like I said in the last episode, um, the way this series works is it's basically like a big chronicle of PowerPoints I've constructed. Um, and I'm just going to go through them each time and see what I can fit into each video. I, there will be a bunch of overlap, to be honest, as well, um, and sort of recapping and revising and continuing on a similar theme. And for that reason, it's totally mandatory that you guys watch this in chronological order. Don't just watch it lazily because it's the first one that came out, but definitely make sure if you haven't seen the first one, you watch that. You haven't seen the second, don't watch the fifth, um, that sort of thing. Okay, so last time we were talking about the early misconceptions, which are the ones that you're most likely to fall into at the beginning of your po online poker career, and the ones I see from my lower level students, sort of 10 and L and below usually, although as I said last time, they can definitely creep into higher level students' games, more experienced students' games, especially during downswings and that kind of thing. Um, so last time, let's jump into the into the PowerPoint. Last time we talked about delusional mental gaming. Um, basically when you first start playing poker and there are so many misconceptions out there in the market that have drawn you into the game and so you sort of place too much emphasis on trying to solve your opponents without enough information um, and not actually thinking about the technical aspects of the game or putting them on a range or whatever. So we talked about that role of psychology, the, the way the media sort of portrays poker and why it is a problem for people to put too much emphasis on the psychological side of things, on their intuition, their gut feelings. Uh, we talked about he thinks, I think, he thinks, what happens when we sort of lose ourselves in this tangent of making assumptions that aren't really justified, manipulating, um, how when we try to manipulate someone, we really need to know what their tendencies are and how they're likely to react. Otherwise, we could end up making a huge mistake, as in that hand. Soul reading hands, um, as opposed to soul reading ranges. If you're going to soul read at all, then definitely try to make sure you're putting your opponent on a range of hands, not just one hand. And then today, we're now on to projecting. So what do I mean by projecting? Projecting is basically when a poker player and their logical decision-making process projects their own thinking patterns, their own sort of ways ways and modes of thinking onto their opponent's game and therefore they reach the conclusion that their opponents are thinking in a way that they are not because they've decided that their opponent must think like them and often that decision is made on a subconscious level it's not something that you in, you really reason out it's just it's a natural a natural intuition um to think in this way and that's because as humans um, in the real world out with poker, we are like-minded creatures. We think in different ways, but we follow many of the same rules and, and paradigms. Although you get people with different personalities, generally everyone likes to make decisions in the same kind of way. Um, if I drop a 10 pound note on the ground, my intuition and my what I'm basically going to do is I'm going to bend down, I'm going to pick it up, I'm going to put it back in my pocket. If you put a thousand humans and put them all in that same situation, um, they're going to act in the same way and they're going to pick up the money. Of course they are. And there's many, many other situations in the real world where people are very predictable. And by reflecting inwards on what your own sort of reasoning would be in a situation, you can definitely predict that of other people and we can decipher their motives for their actions. And we can do this all the time. We can do this every day. Uh, by referen referencing what our own motive would be in some situation. If we were them, what would we do? And often, if it's a common spot where humans are likely to function in the same way in, we can make an inference that because these variables are very clear and they match up, um, another person's motives are likely to be very similar in that situation as well, and their action is therefore going to be very similar. They're also going to stop up, stop and pick up the money. Um, so... That's interesting, and that's where the intuition comes from to do this, to do this projecting in the realm of poker. 
Um, but life is a different kind of realm from the poker realm. Life is a familiar realm and we have a lot of perfect information. For example, when I drop the £10 note and I bend down to pick it up, I know that by doing that, I, I will possess the £10 note again. There's not really too much ambiguity as to what's going to happen if I pick up the £10 note that I dropped on the floor. It's going to be mine. Um, it's not the case that sometimes it will be mine and sometimes a giant bird will come and take it out of my hands. It's not really going to happen. There's not as much variance in life. There's not as many unknown variables. I know that unless something very, very rare and bizarre occurs, I am going to be able to regain that money by taking the action of picking it up. So in life, we have a lot of perfect information. That's basically the, the lesson to be drawn from that mini story. Um, poker is very different. It's a very unfamiliar realm with imperfect information. So I might know that by betting in the river, I might make my opponent fold a decent amount of the time, but it's nowhere near as perfect as the information of me picking up that money on the street. The result of that is I will gain that money. The result of me bluffing the river is far from me gaining all the money in the pot because sometimes my opponent will call, sometimes he will raise. This is the reality in poker. Um, we don't always know, or we don't know, we never know really what our opponent's going to do 100% of the time unless we have an, a very sick read. That's a very particular and even rare type of situation. So. Poker is a far less familiar realm. Um, there are also lots of other factors going on that we just don't know about, like I brushed on last time. Um, I touched upon this in part one. There can be just variables that are completely out with our potential for knowing. For example, our opponent might just be on Skype and Facebook at the same time as playing a session and might be distracted and therefore might not be thinking clearly about our actions. Therefore, we might not be, you know, manipulating him to do what we think we are because he's just not paying attention. He's just not thinking what we think he's thinking, which is why it's so dangerous when you're not very skilled at it and don't have good reads to launch down that road if he thinks that I think. So so yeah, poker is very unfamiliar. We don't there's just so much information that we can be aware of and the information that we are aware of is imperfect and that it won't be the case all of the time, only some percentages of the time that constitutes its likelihood and it's that likelihood that we use to make decisions and profit in the long run. It's not about knowing exactly what's going to happen all the time. So because of this, the reflective inference that we use on a daily basis to predict what our friends or family, random people we've just met are going to do and why they're going to do it, this just doesn't work anywhere near as well in the realm of poker because of those two above points. We just don't have perfect information um, and we don't have and it's very unfamiliar, there are a lot of factors that are going to occur as well that we just didn't know were going to happen. Um, so in the poker, although it's ingrained in us to sort of project our own thought processes onto other people and assume that they think the way we think in many, many situations, in poker this is not the case. And your mind will adjust to not thinking in this way, but it will take a little bit of time before you break the natural intuitive desire to think in this way, definitely. It's not the case that you can just walk into the poker world and quickly change all these patterns, all these neuron connections that your brain has been used to making for a very long time. Um, I'm not a neuroscientist, I'm not even going to pretend I know the slightest thing about how the brain works, but I'd imagine that when it's, it seems that anyway, when your brain is trained to think in a certain way, i.e. for example, uh, projecting your thoughts onto other people, then it's going to try and do that in other situations as well. And it takes a little bit of time for you to override that um, that urge. So why is projecting dangerous? Project projecting is dangerous because it just leads to inaccurate information. Anything in poker that leads to flawed, inaccurate, or less probable than you think information is going to be dangerous for your win rate. It's going to cause you to make bad decisions, and it's going to be good for your opponents. So. We don't want to be doing something, we don't want to be projecting our game into other people unless we have some very good read that they think in the same way. Perhaps if I already taught my student how to play, then I played him at poker. Um, I've taught him a lot of ways of thinking that I know um, are direct projections of the way I think, but I know that that's the case. We can't just assume that this is the case normally because poker is such a complex area. It's so unclear like how to approach it that we don't have these like clear paradigms of thought like we have in life. Instead, what we need to do 
uh, sort of navigate our way around this sort of dark area that's still not very explored explored so just because you think in a certain way in a situation definitely does not mean that your opponent does just because you expect um, a seabed to be very air heavy on a certain texture that's of a certain size it does not mean your opponent thinks that just because you would never use that size as a bluff raise doesn't mean your opponent wouldn't and just because you would never consider he recalling this river does not mean your opponent wouldn't what's more important is to think about the kind of player your opponent is and what kind of decisions he's likely to make based on that for example he's a 53 8 fish he's going to be making a lot of poor decisions such as calling this river when no one else would something like that but not just but not i wouldn't call so he wouldn't call so it's definitely a trap that's very very common people do it all the time it leads to the he thinks i think kind of mentality we talked about before it leads to making unjustified like weird soul reads and that kind of thing projecting is a big cause of just flawed thinking in the early stages of poker and it's something that you need to try not to do very quickly um, another way that people can project that causes a lot of problems is when they overestimate villains capacity based on their own capacity for thinking about poker situations for example um, they might know that a certain thing is true in a certain spot that you shouldn't um, turn a good draw that has you shouldn't turn a good draw that's not strong enough to get it in with into a bluff raise unless you have some fold equity because otherwise you risk being blown out of the pot. Um, if you then transfer that logic over to your opponent and say, my opponent knows this, therefore he's not doing this with a good draw with the can call and all in, then you know you can see you're just making you're guilty of 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 making this fallacy basically. Um, there's no reason for you to think that, but it is very tempting nevertheless to turn poker into, in order to try and simplify it, to turn it into this leveling battle of he thinks, I think, and therefore he must think this because I think this, that simplifies the game and instinctively we're always looking for ways to simplify this game because it's very difficult and very complicated. So that's definitely, those are the main drawbacks of, of projecting and the ways that they are manifested. Um, so here's an example about projecting before we move on to talk about variance. Um, we're in the button with 9-7 of diamonds and we open to three big blinds, the small blind and the big blind who are unknown fish, both call. You might be thinking, what do you mean unknown fish? Surely if we know they're a fish, they're not unknown. Um, yeah, but what I mean is we don't know very much about what's how they are a fish specifically. We just know that they have fishy stats, they call too much, they may be like limping in, pre-flop, limp folding, whatever. They're doing something a regular would never do, so by process of elimination we can just say that they're a fish, but we don't yet know exactly where their fish leaks lie, although we can certainly make some estimates that they call too much, that they're stationary, that they don't think about situations very well, and they're not very good at putting their opponent on a range and acting accordingly. And they have strange motivations that aren't very logical for a lot of actions, but we don't know exactly um, in what way that's the case yet. So the small blind checks, the big blind checks, and, oh sorry, the small blind checks, the big blind leads for 22 BBs into a 9 BB pot, makes like a gross overbet here. Um, it's kind of like a strange situation. Action to us, we have small blind still to act behind us on this 9-5-2 board. We have top pair, mediocre kicker, and we're not super happy about life. What are we going to do? Here is another very common type of reasoning that my student will make in this sort of spot. Um, no specific student, but lots of lower level students in general will say something of this nature. They will say, well, this would be a ridiculous value size, as villain could never expect much action from worse hands. And yeah, this is true. But again, what are you doing right there? You're projecting your knowledge onto your opponent's game. You know that you know that by making such a massive overbet you're folding out most of the worst hands it could call and only and narrowing your opponent's continuing ranges to mainly better hands but why would your opponent know that and if he does know that is he even going to think about it upon making this decision so right there this projection that's already distorted things and you've just got off to your reasoning in a bad way in an unsound way he can't be looking to get called as this is a silly size to use therefore he must be looking for folds so i'm going to call okay so if these premises are true like the argument's going to be fairly logical, it's going to be fine, but the premises just aren't true um, necessarily. And also the argument's not that sound either because 
or the reasoning is not that sound because you still have another player to act behind you as well. At the times that you're beat by him, he's probably not folding. That's going to suck. Um, he's another fish that's just going to continue with a lot of better stuff and not much worse stuff. So that sucks as well. But mainly, um, this is bad because you're projecting your knowledge of bet sizing onto your opponent um, and sort of assuming that he's thinking in one way when he could be thinking lots of things. For example, um, the problem is exactly why do you believe he thinks in this way or even thinks at all? He might just be mashing a button, he might see a 9 on the board, look down and see a 9 in his hand, like a very primitive like decision making process and then just bash in a big number because of it. 9 plus another 9 equals pair equals bet big. That could be his thought process very easily. Like this is the thing. He's a fish. He's a recreational player. Do not try and um, project your knowledge onto his game. It's just not going to be the case that he has that knowledge. So what should we do here? Um, how should we think about this spot? I think that it's very unusual for any kind of fish, unless other than the biggest of maniacs, to throw a massive amount of money into a small pot like this on such a dry board where there's nothing to protect against without something. I would imagine his range is like maybe some spewy gut shots or something like that. But also just a lot of depolarized sort of top pair or over pair stuff or maybe even two pair, random suited two pair or set or something. I think he can actually have a range here that crushes 9-7 of diamonds. He's just bet like more than twice the pot three way. There's no reason to think 9-7 of diamonds is good very often in this situation. I think his range basically crushes us. Um, so if we keep an open mind and just put him on a range of hands, thinking about his player type and how often a player like this just bets three times the pot almost with a bluff. On such a dry board, I just think that um, as long as we stick to to that procedure, what does the player type do, we're going to be fine and we'll be able to make a good decision here. We avoid the trap, the common pitfall of projecting some kind of you know, plausible logic, but onto an opponent who just probably doesn't have that logic. At this projecting Eric is just very huge and it has very bad consequences, so try not to do it. Okay, I'm going to move on now to the topic of variance in the NCOD. Um, the NCOD is a term you've probably heard before, but not as an acronym. I just wanted to save some space. It stands for the Newbie Circle of Death, and it's quite a common term in the poker world. The newbie circle of death we'll get to later is basically one of the results of not understanding variance properly. Um, variance is huge in poker. It's basically like, it's kind of like the, the best thing and the worst thing about being a poker player, if you like. It's the best thing because if it wasn't for variance, fish wouldn't play. And it's the worst thing because it's the fucking pain in the ass all the time and it really gets on your nerves and it drives your emotions crazy. As you know, if you've ever tried to play poker for a living or dedicated a considerable amount of time or energy into this game, it can be very irritating. So we can come to terms with variance though and appreciate the good parts whilst understanding the bad parts and sort of um, acclimatize ourselves to variance and understand it better. Um, and to do that, we're going to look at it in depth today. Um, we're going to start by looking at some terminology that we're going to need to truly understand what variance is a result of and where it comes from and what it means. And then we're going to move on and talk about and look at some genuine simulations of variance. I call it the shocking truth. What is variance actually like over 10,000 hands? If you have X win rate, what can you really expect to happen on average? And we're going to see some simulations of different possible outcomes based on basically based on how much variance is in your local, your regular game. Um, and then we're going to see that the results can actually differ wildly, even over sample sizes that you might before have considered relevant. Um, so that's going to be scary, but also kind of gratifying in a way, because it, there are a lot of benefits that can come from truly understanding the extent of variance in 6 Max No Limit Hold'em um, and filtering to an extent, but a slightly lesser extent. Um, so that's good. That's definitely a positive thing to understand it. Um, we're going to talk about the effects of variance. What does it mean for poker that there is such a big element of luck in the short term? What does it mean that it's not chess, basically? What are the differences between a game like chess, which is all skill, and a game like poker, where there's so much luck in the short term? What are the pluses, the minuses, and what does that what does that cause? What does that cause us to do um, as poker players? 
Then we're going to talk about understanding variance and all the great benefits that can come from truly accepting what variance is and logically just admitting that it exists and accepting that you cannot control it in the short term and that your results do not directly translate into how great you are. And then following nicely from that is the newbie circle of death where we're going to talk about the dangers, what can happen if you don't fully understand variance basically. Um, what kind of tilt can you fall into? What kind of pitfalls await you if you're going to not embrace variance for what it really is? So, or even come close to embracing it for what it really is. I have students, have had students in the past and probably always will have students who will say something like, I won four buy-ins today. I really think I'm getting better. I can feel it. This is my first winning day and it must be because of the coaching. And as much uh, as, much as as a coach, I would like to say, yes, I have made you win those four buy-ins. It's just a ridiculous thing to say because you can win four buy-ins and be the worst player in the world. You can lose 10 buy-ins and be the best player in the world. What happens in one session is just completely irrelevant to your overall progress. Your overall progress is a result of the long term and how well you've done over a considerable amount of hands. Um, okay, so fascinating topic. Almost should have had a whole video to itself, but I'm going to try and get through all of it today anyway. So let's launch into some terminology first. And we're going to need this terminology in order to perform some variance calculations and sort of understand what's really going on here. SD stands for standard deviation. It's the measure of the average amount of variance in your game. Your standard deviation will be high if you have a very aggressive style. If you're very active at the table, if you're very aggressive, it will be low. If you're more passive, you play a more sort of rigid game and don't get into as many spots where variance can hit you, basically. Variance can affect you in any spot, but it will affect you more in spots where you get money in without too much of an equity advantage, for example. If you get in, like, jacks over your jacks against someone's king-queen, you're like a very slight favourite, you've made a good play, to simplify things dramatically, um, you've probably made a good play, but the thing is that there's a lot of variance in this spot because your EV is much lower, because your equity edge is lower, you're only 52% favourite or whatnot, and so it's going to take a very, very long time before that translates to anything meaningful. So your standard deviation will be higher if you have if you take more of these marginal situations for a lot of money and it will be lower if you play a more nitty controlled style but that's not to say any style is better than the other it's just whatever works for you variance doesn't affect your results directly in the long run it doesn't affect your the real results of your skill it only affects the results of luck which even out anyway so it's not a reason to be tight or loose it's just standard deviation is simply the measure of variance in your game it's the amount of variance in your game and you can actually find it by running a hold of manager or PT4 report over a large sample, find out what your SD is. Um, and I'll talk more about SD um, soon. I think for six max, it's usually around 60 to 100. If I'm not mistaken, I checked mine, it was about 80. This was a, about a year ago or something, but we'll look at SD more in a minute when we get to running some simulations. Win rate in BB per 100 is the number of big blinds you win on average per 100 hands and it's determined by your skill advantage over the average competition. So if you're a really good player, your average, your BB per 100 average will be like 6 big blinds, 8 big blinds, 10 big blinds. If you just have a small advantage over your competition, it will be 1 or 2 big blinds. Um, obviously there's a relationship here between BB per 100 and standard deviation. The higher your win rate, the lower your, sorry, between variance and and win rate, the higher your win rate, the lower your variance will generally be. The less downswings you'll have to encounter, the smaller the downswings will be, the bigger the upswings will be, the more it will level out in the long run. You won't go through terrible times as much. Um, so yeah, your variance is basically calculated um, by combining your win rate and your standard deviation. You can select a win rate, which lowers your variance, and a standard deviation will, the higher the standard deviation is, the higher your variance will be. So the amount of variance you encounter is going to be a sort of a relationship between these two things and how they balance out, basically. Um, so variance is literally just the separation between expected results and actual results based on the fact that poker has an increasingly larger luck factor over a smaller sample over an increasingly smaller sample. Um, 
you have something called all NEV that I'm sure you've all seen in your graphs and like to have a look at out of interest and things. All NEV is one of the ways in which uh, variance is this sort of discrepancy between real results and expected results as measured. There are lots of other ways that that discrepancy can exist though. It's not simply based on the times that you got it all in and how well you did. It's based on all the other types of situation where you didn't get it all in. The time you had to fall because your opponent had the top of his range and shoved over your bluff. That's not reflected at all in your all in EV, but it's still variance of the same kind and it still represents uh, the separation between expected results and actual results based on luck. Um, then we've got simulation, which is a randomly generated result found by running out X amount of hands with a certain SD and win rate as our input variables. So we're going to plug some SD into a little nifty program, some win rates in, and have a look at the simulation and see what the different simulations show. It will give you 20 simulations at random. Um, based on that SD and that win rate, and that those will reflect what your variance looks like. How close they are together is the measure of variance, basically. So let's do that now. Okay, um, I have the program here. So as you can see, um, we have a few input values. We have win rate in big blinds per 100. So let's say, let's call that, um, let's say that you're only a marginal winner or a decent marginal winner um, three big blinds is not so bad. You win three big blinds per 100 hands. That's okay. Um, standard deviation, and this is a true win rate. This is like a true win rate, not just an observed win rate. This is like your actual win rate over like thousands and millions of hands. You know this is your win rate, just for talking's sake. It's very hard to know your actual win rate, as we're about to see. Um, standard deviation between 60 and 100, I think, is average. Let's plug in 80 and say that this is for an average 6 max player. And um, we're going to simulate... Um, how many hands should we simulate? Let's start at the beginning and just show how ridiculous it is when someone says, oh, I've had a winning session, look how much better I've got. Let's say they played 500 hands in a session. Let's see what the different results can be here. This will give us 20 different results with their win rate. What's going to happen? Let's hit calculate. This should, okay. So here are big lines. Here we have the EV line and the baseline is zero. This bold line is the EV line. This is what the EV actually is, what's expected to happen. Their EV here, if they have this win rate, is 15 big blinds. That's how much they can expect to win. If you play 100 NL and you play a session like this, you can expect to win $15 on average if that's your win rate in those games. One of these sessions, they've won 608 big blinds, they've won six buy-ins. Another one, they've lost four buy-ins. Um, they've lost three and a half buy-ins, they've lost two and a half buy-ins, they've won 300 big blinds. It's just very, very random. Let's run it again and see what happens. It will just give us another one. Look look at this downswing. This poor guy has lost six buy-ins in one session. That's just a one in, out of 20 simulations. One of them has lost six buy-ins. Um, so to tell me that your coaching has made you one in that one session is just pretty ludicrous. Okay, so hopefully that's like eye-opening for how little a session depends on your win rate, which you probably already knew. But now let's make, let's say that you've played 5,000 hands. Sometimes people who don't put in a lot of volume because they have other commitments and they don't multi-table too much um, will play 500,000 hands in a month and they'll say, this is my best month ever, look how well I'm doing. Well, I've got news for you. This is just one simulation. It could have been something else. But your EV over those hands is still only just over one buy-in you're only entitled to win one buy-in with the law of averages here. The worst thing that happened here with these with these 20 samples samples over 5,000 hands and confidence intervals yeah I think that means EV confidence intervals and samples and BB best and worst run out of a thousand trials Okay, I think this is still just a random 20 because it's different every time. Um, so this one, for example, is really bad. We lost 18 buy-ins in 5,000 hands during the month. We like You could have the same win rate. This could be your win rate and you could win 16 buy-ins or you could lose 18 buy-ins. We calculate again. If we keep doing this, we should find that most of them are above the line. Here we have like one, two, three. How many losing months have we had here? 
one, two, three, four, five, six, and 14 positive months. So only like a third, two thirds of our months are actually positive. The rest are losing. So with this win rate and only playing 5,000 hands a month, only two thirds of your months are likely to be positive. If we do it again, just for talking's sake, this one's even worse. We've got seven or eight losing months now or something like that. One really, really terrible month where we just downsprung horribly and lost 17. One where we won 16. Um, this one is not so bad. We're not losing so much in this one. Only 14 buy-ins. But as you can see, 5,000 hands means very little. So let's change it up now and take the same win rate and give ourselves a bigger amount of hands um, to simulate. So let's now say that we play 50,000 hands. That's a lot of hands to put in a month. 50,000. Let's calculate what happens. We should find a bit more regularity, basically. Is that changed? Calculate. Okay. 50,000 hands. That's incredible. We still have like loads of, of losing of losing months here, as you can see. Well, we have a few. This is the EV line here. We're running half these half these lines should be above the EV, EV line, half should be below. Obviously, that's how EV works on average. That's the case. But where's our zero line here? We've still got like four losing months we've put in out of 20. So one fifth of the time we'll still have a, a losing month when we play 50k hands um, and have a three big bet win rate. And one of them is like a really bad 20 buy-in losing month. So it's just, it just shows like how much, how likely it is that this can actually happen basically. Um, these are the, I haven't looked into this enough to understand exactly what a 95% confidence interval is. It basically means it will happen less than 95%. It will happen no more than 5% of the time, basically, based on this amount of simulations. If we change this now and we say that we make the sample even bigger, let's say that we've played 300,000 hands, 300,000 hands in a year. This is quite a good amount of hands to have played. Let's calculate and see what actually happens. So now, with this win rate, we've still, out of 20 simulations, we've had a year where we've lost lots of money, and that's really bad. Sorry guys, I need to pause the video because someone's knocking. Okay, sorry to disrupt for the minor disruption there. My flatmate wanted some oil as it happened. So, um, so yeah, this is quite worrying. Like this, Here's the zero line, and we still have we still have one of these simulations out of 20 where we have lost money during the year despite the fact that we played 300,000 hands, which basically means there's like a 1 in 20 chance that this could happen, or at least in this situation there is. Um, we've had one year where we win lots of money. We've had most of the time we're winning here. Our EV, as we can see, is like plus, plus 8,820, plus 88 big blinds basically but yeah we can still lose 24 and it's just scary 24 buy-ins in the year so yeah that's variance for you it is crazy and it just shows that you're more likely to win if you have a good win rate if we make this win rate better now um let's say that we have an eight big blind win rate which is like really really good and do it over 300,000 hands then we'll find that Here we can find that. So here we have a situation where we've not had any losing months. It's obviously made a big difference that our variance is our variance has been reduced somewhat by the fact that our win rate is considerably higher. Um, so that's cool. That's good. But as you can see, within these winning years of three hundred thousand hands, there's still some that are considerably better than others. Like if we play for 20 years with this win rate nonstop, one year we've won like, what have we won? 38, 380 buy-ins. And one year we've only won 91 buy-ins. So it's like a huge difference. And um, it just goes to show that most of the time though, 
you can see that the larger the sample, the closer these results are going to get towards the EV line. So if we say 800,000 instead, and we calculate that, we'll find that these lines get closer and closer and closer to the EV line. But you can see to get, some people think that this is a result of having a small win rate and playing 20,000 hands, but that's not. They expect that this is what it should look like. If they're winning, it should just go straight up. And if they're losing, it should go, it should have different, um, should go up and down a little bit. But that's definitely not the case. You've got a situation where you have to play an extremely large amount of hands in order to achieve that kind of result. So yeah, food for thought. This website you can see is called pokerdope.com forward slash poker variance calculator. Um, check it out, play about with it on your own. I just wanted to give you guys a little tour of it. And now I'm gonna launch back into my uh, PowerPoint. So what are the effects of variance? So the first thing variance does is it misleads grinders as to how well they are performing, causing unjustified doubt, optimism, confidence, arrogance, fear, and lots of other emotions, basically. If you, you don't know which of those 20 lines you're currently on, if any, you don't know how accurate your win rate is, you don't, you don't know how typical the current spell is of your win rate and what's gonna happen over 800,000 hands, you just have no idea. Um, so because of that, you can get all kinds of emotions that can affect your state of mind and your game and that kind of thing. It can be pretty detrimental to you if you're experiencing the negative ones, like fear, uh, doubt. It can be nice if, you've, if you're getting unjustified optimism, can actually be a bonus. It can keep you in a good state of mind and actually make you play better. Um, so variance does have pros and cons, but if it's causing overconfidence, arrogance, um, unjustified, arrogance and where your ego basically just accelerates it goes through the roof and um then that's going to be really bad for you it's going to cause tell in the future it's going to cause you know the bigger you build up your ego the bigger a smashing it takes when you hit a bit of bad variance so yeah um but variance also attracts weaker recreational players mainly because it instills these same unjustified emotions in them and makes them like poker um keeps losing players interested because they can win in the short term. That's what keeps fish coming back to the game is variance. If it wasn't for variance, we'd have a like stagnant industry like chess. And believe me, I'm, I've been a part of it and it's not very thriving. It's not very booming because there's no real money to be made in the chess world. Even the best chess players in the world can't do it for a living. Some of them can the very best, but a lot of grandmasters can't because they can't fish are not stupid enough. Chess fish are not dumb enough to sit down and play for like a hundred bucks a match against some of the world's best chess players. But in poker, that does happen. You get guys sitting around the highest games and you get fish um, just coming into the game and thinking, I'll take a shot at this guy, I can beat him. And they will sometimes as well, that's the thing. That's why variance is so good. So that's why chess is seldom played for money, but poker on the other hand is quite a lot. Um, so variance has that bonus, that's definitely a good thing. It also reinforces decision-making processes as good or bad, irrespective of whether they actually are. Um, you can make a decision that can lead to you winning lots of money, or you can make a decision that can lead to you losing lots of money. You can do the same thing five times and do very well, or you can do the very same thing five times and do very badly. But what variance will do to you is it will make you think that there's a genuine link sometimes between your action and the, the consequence of the action, where there's in fact no such link. So that's definitely something that you have to be careful of. You don't want really bad behavior or really bad um, bad actions to be enforced as good ideas just based on the result of variance. That's why you want to look at your winning hands as well, not just your losing hands. You want to look at the hand in isolation of the variance. And that's why as poker players, we say don't show results when you post a hand. We don't care if you won or lost a hand. It doesn't matter, it's totally irrelevant. All that matters is, was the hand played well? Because over the short term, variance can give you a completely skewed result. I mean, if you think about those 300,000 hands we saw and how much variation there was with a normal standard deviation, think about like four hands, if you play them in the same way, anything could really happen. Um, so yeah, variance makes people very rich, which is another thing that attracts people to the game. The fish can see like Jamie Gold getting really rich in the 2000 and seven was it world series of poker i don't even remember now might have been 2006 but anyway they see mr gold and all his i want to be the best bluffer in the world i remember he said once i want i don't want to be the best poker player in the world i want to be the best bluffer 
it's just like one of the most absurd statements ever because like okay yeah i guess you could interpret that as he's really good at finding spots to bluff in but like if you just bluff all the time like he did you're kind of unbalanced and fairly easy to play against so variants can make people really rich because if you have an image like jamie gold and you just run absolutely shit crazy hot for three days of the main event of the world series you get your run good at that time then you're just like that's just like dream world obviously that's amazing you're just going to do so well um so it makes people rich and that attracts people in turn to the game and makes a profit with the reg for the regs which in turn makes them rich which attracts more people and it's a lovely little cycle um where that happens but variance also tilts irritates and enrages normally level-headed people i read a story once on two plus two about a guy who plunged a swiss combat army knife through his leg because he was running really bad and severed a major artery and almost died um, this is the kind of thing variants can do. That's why it's not easy to be a professional poker player. It's not necessarily fun all the time. It's not as glamorous. There is a lot of freedom. It's a great lifestyle for some. For me, it's not that great a lifestyle because um, I don't like the fact that variance exists. I do like it, but at the same time, it makes things difficult. And you do need to do a lot of work on your mental game in order to overcome that. And we are going to talk about the benefits of variance next time and how to avoid the new newbie circle of death. Um, but variance is tough, it makes the game hard. You can be a very skilled poker player, but never make it because you have a tilt problem that's caused by variance, basically. If you're always irritated and enraged and accentuating your downswings, then that's gonna be much worse. Whereas if you are if you can just play your a good A game or B game throughout bad variance, you'll just be so much more successful. So it depends what you're like as a person, how much variance does affect you and how much work you put into your mental game to stop it affecting you basically in a negative way. But it is there, it's a danger and it can stop people from having successful poker careers who could otherwise have been very successful. So yeah, pluses and minuses. Variance is also a wave though that you can ride to play your A game. That should be a capitalized A. Um, variance is like, it can make you feel great because you might put in loads of hard work and then hit a patch of good variance and then the two together will just spiral your win rate right up. And sometimes that's nothing better. There's no better feeling and your game goes from strength to strength. You float, you, you're uh, brimming with confidence. You're playing your best game all the time and you're just basically owning. Um, and when you get on one of those runs, you can just whack away like a good 50 buy-ins in your favor and just make a lot of progress through the stakes or whatever. So variance is a wave that you can ride, but whatever way it's going, it tends to take the poker player with it and you will write it up, you will write it down, that kind of thing. So yeah, next time we're gonna talk about the benefits of variance. There's a little, just like this is next time, you don't get to see it yet. And then we're gonna finish talking about variance in episode three. And if time allows, we are going to start talking about situational results orientation which is definitely some another pitfall that's linked to variance very closely and what kind of ways do we get results orientated and on a situational basis rather than an overall results basis okay so that's pretty much all i've got to say in episode two and i'll see you guys in episode three thank you very much for watching goodbye for now